But what we see here is that these were heathens, men who did not know the Lord, and they, ha they held devotions. To be devoted means to be uh, um, wholly given over to someone. I had, I had a woman tell me one day, because I mentioned how one of the brothers who are famous on television, he would have people scratch out verses here and there years ago, and she was upset because she told me in an email, I'm devoted to that man. And I wrote her back, I said, the only man you're supposed to be devoted to is your husband, okay? The only human a, a woman is to be devoted to is her husband. That's it. That's, that's the scriptures. And obviously the Lord. So I told her, don't get your heart into some preacher. Because if he tells you the wrong thing, you're going to have to go with the word over him. So I just, I just thought about that. Devoted means to be totally given over to something. And what these heathens were totally given over, look at verse 23. For as I passed by, Paul says, and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. So the fact that they had altars there, what, what altars are, particularly in the scriptures, altars are where you make sacrifices. Now, today, people, well, some people do. I guess, I guess in some lands, in some places, they are still sacrificing animals in some heathen lands. But over in our country, usually there's some type of altar, and people put pictures of their children or of their family members. And that, that, that's, all, that's all in the spirit of that. There's nothing wrong with pictures. I want you to see. But altars, is where you put whatever you're devoted to, that's where you make the sacrifice right there. And that's what they were doing. And they had one of many altars, verse 23, to the unknown God. Just in case they miss one of the gods, because they had many gods, pantheon of gods, they had all these gods. Just in case we miss one, we'll just put to the unknown one. And Paul uses that we saw last time, verse 23, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. They were worshiping, but they were doing it ignorantly. Now, last week we left off, or last time, two weeks ago, we left off where the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 he deals with the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman who was who, who was of Jewish blood. They had they had went off in apostasy back there in the Old Testament. They, they, they didn't want to worship at Jerusalem where God told them to worship. And so they made their own little religious system up in the northern tribes there. And he goes to her and he says, you know what? Ye know not what ye worship, ye, ye, ye Samaritans. We know what we worship. Speaking of the Jews for salvation is of the Jews. John 4, 22. And so God is going to take those two, um, those, those two separated nations, as it were, Israel, the northern ten tribes, and then Judah, and put them back together through the Lord. That's why he must needs go to Samaria. That's the doctrine of, of the book of John, a future doctrine where he puts the tribes together. But he says they ignorantly worship. Well, Paul says it also. Look what he says in the end of verse 23. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So what I want you to see is they were going about their worshiping of the gods. And they said, well, there's a God that we might be missing. It's that God that God sent Paul to share. So the first thing we're going to, send, we're going to see is that Paul is the one who's about to explain who God is. That's important because we're going to see that's a great principle for the dispensation of God's grace. The dispensation of grace is going to be Paul, the apostle, our apostle, who's going to explain who God is. Now, watch what Paul did. Verse 24. But, but you know what? Before you go there, let me let me show you what the Lord said. Go to hold your hand and go to Matthew six. I, I want to touch on this. I, I, I realize some people might see other people praying and, 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 and being religious. And, but the Lord makes it clear that you could be religious. And still you, you have no clue who God is. We see it all in our culture. I want you to see a couple of things. Go to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord talks about prayer. Matthew chapter 6, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's not written to you and I today. Just on the radio, that where we have our radio program, I listened just this week, last week, like three or four different ministers teaching out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, particularly Matthew 6, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And they getting all caught up in what the verses says. One guy was in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, where, where, where he says it was Chuck Smith, the word for today. He was in Matthew 6, 15, and where the Lord says, if ye don't forgive men your, their trespasses, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. And he says, as he thought about it, I could see it. I could hear it. He, he says, well, I don't want to contradict or say the Lord is, it doesn't mean what he says. So he left the verse alone. Here's why. He knows that forgiveness in the dispensation of grace is based not on your performance, but on what Christ did. So he understands forgiveness is based on the, the trusting Christ. 
But because he doesn't rightly divide, when you get to a passage like Matthew 6, 15, that says, if you don't forgive, neither will God forgive you. Instead of dealing with it, he says, well, that's a hard passage. I'm not going to contradict the Lord, but he didn't have an answer. Why? Because he's in a different dispensation. He's under the law there. He's teaching that passage to members of the body as if it's speaking to us. He, does, he, he, he didn't go so far as to contradict the Lord. He even says it. I'm not going to contradict the Lord here, but he did. He could not reconcile what Paul says in Ephesians 4, 32, with what the Lord said, and simply because he didn't rightly divide. Well, look at this in Matthew 6, this whole Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 7. He says, but when ye pray, use not what type of repetitions? Vain. You can use repetitions. It's a wonderful thing. I always start every prayer with, Heavenly Father, thank you for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his cross work. That's not a vain repetition. That's a repetition that has some doctrine. It's the truth. You need, to, you need to know that. But vain repetitions. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The official prayer of Roman Catholicism, the official prayer of Lutherism, and all other types of religions. The Our Father prayer. Well, it's vain repetition in the dispensation of grace. That's a prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. That's Israel. Hallowed be thy name. Holy is thy name. Reverence, they reverence his name. Thy kingdom come. Bring your kingdom down. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They're calling for the kingdom. They're not saying, like Paul tells us, looking for the blessed hope and to go to heaven. They're looking for heaven's kingdom to come down. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Just like their fathers were in the wilderness coming out of, uh, of the Egypt with Moses, God gave them daily manna every day. Except the, the one day where he gave him two days worth for the Sabbath, but every day. OK, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we do what? Forgive those who trespass against us. Right. That's that's this. Matthew, he says, forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's their program. God would forgive them their sins against others based on how they would forgive others. He doesn't deal with us today. So that's vain repetitions and deliver us from evil. 